Don't let YouTube decide what information you get. That's your choice. YouTube is deleting our videos and cuts you off from a source of honest reporting. Make sure you don't lose access to NTD's news content and take a quick moment to subscribe to our newsletter so no matter what happens here, you'll keep your access to a trustworthy news source. It's the Sunshine State versus the Golden State. California and Florida have vastly different lockdown policies, but their virus numbers paint a similar picture. NTD's Christina Kim takes a closer look. Florida and California are on opposite coasts and have had largely opposite lockdown approaches. So when it comes to the pandemic, you wouldn't expect many similarities between the two. But take a look at their cases. According to the CDC, Florida has a total of 1.8 million cases. Adjusting this for population, this means over 8,400 cases per 100,000 people. There are 136 deaths per 100,000. Let's look at California. California has a total of 3.4 million cases. Putting this into context, it's 8,600 cases per 100,000 people and 120 deaths per 100,000. Johns Hopkins University data shows the number of cases as a percentage of the population. California's is roughly 8.8 percent, while Florida's is around 8.3 percent. Appearing on MSNBC Live, White House COVID-19 advisor Andy Slavitt was asked why California's numbers aren't that different from Florida, even though California is, quote, basically in lockdown. Look, there's so much of this virus that we think we understand, that we think we can predict, that's just beyond a little bit beyond our explanation. California has been one of the strictest states since the pandemic. Governor Gavin Newsom implemented stay-at-home orders, limiting gatherings and shutting down businesses. Florida's Governor Ron DeSantis has taken a different approach. After issuing a lockdown order in April, DeSantis opened up, saying, quote, no lockdowns, no fines, no school closures. Slavitt didn't give any further explanation on why the states have similar virus trends, but he says that more masking, social distancing and vaccines will lessen the spread and make the virus go away quicker. The White House advisor notes that variants make things harder to predict. Christina Kim, NTD News. An Oregon teacher's training program says math has elements of white supremacy and racism. NTD's Christina Kim explores the Marxist origins of this ideology and the details of this, quote, anti-racist training program. Oregon's Education Department is promoting a training program to help teachers, quote, develop an anti-racist math practice. The program is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and partners with many education and math organizations. According to the toolkit, teachers must work to, quote, dismantle white supremacy in math classrooms by visibilizing toxic characteristics of white supremacy. This is talking about injecting into a hard science ideas of oppression and supremacy. And as critical theory does, uh, it takes this notion of uh, the postmodern notion of really no absolute truth and sort of sprinkling that throughout. Critical theory has origins in Marxism, which separates the world into oppressors versus the oppressed. Critical race theory takes that framework and looks at the world through a racial lens, separating people into racist and anti-racist. Education expert Jonathan Butler says this idea says people should look at narratives to describe the world. In other words, there are no absolute truths, only narratives. This is talking about injecting into a hard science ideas of oppression and supremacy. This toolkit says it's white supremacy for teachers to ask students to show their work or focus on the right answer. Teachers are encouraged to ask their students to come up with at least two answers that might solve a math problem. A reference workbook similarly says the belief in objectivity is a characteristic of white supremacy. It claims it's racist to believe there is such a thing as being objective or neutral. Instead, one should assume that everybody has a valid point. But what this is doing is taking a very political and I think um, extremely uh, circular and, and frankly uh, logically incoherent concept and sticking it into math. The fact is, American students struggle with math. And Butler says injecting this ideology into math is especially not helpful for students given the situation. According to a 2017 Pew Research poll, when comparing the average math score for 15-year-old students, American students rank nine slots under the average and 94 points below the top-scoring country, Singapore. At the pandemic, students have fallen back considerably in math, scoring an average of 5 to 10 percentile points lower than the previous year. 
Butler clarifies this doesn't mean educators don't want to be sensitive towards students with difficult backgrounds. But this ideology isn't what it seems to be. And there is this sense that it sounds righteous and justified. But once you scratch the surface, and it doesn't take long, what you find in critical race theory is, frankly, intolerance and a new form of bias. And that's what's being perpetuated here. Butler believes parents should know what their children are being taught and that parents should have more choice in their children's education. Christina Kim, NTD News. A New York City restaurant just fired a waitress for asking to wait to get the virus vaccine. The waitress says she and her husband are trying for a baby and they're concerned about the vaccine's effects on pregnancy. NTD's Patrick Hayden has the details. 34-year-old Bonnie Jacobson started working at the Red Hook Tavern in August and had good reviews. Earlier this month, the restaurant emailed employees saying, if you choose to get a vaccine, here's what you need to know. Jacobson expressed her concerns about getting the vaccine because she was trying to get pregnant. She said her manager initially understood, saying she wouldn't be required to get it. But then days later, the restaurant changed its mind, making it mandatory. She emailed her employers saying she didn't want to get it yet and needed more time. They fired her two days later. Jacobson says she's not an anti-vaxxer but has concerns around pregnancy. She thinks it's more important for her 68-year-old diabetic father to get the shot before she does. The CDC says the risk of mRNA vaccines to pregnant women and unborn children are unknown because they haven't been tested on pregnant women. The restaurant owner told NTD, no one has faced these challenges before and we made a decision what we thought would best protect everyone. He says they've updated their policy so it's clear to staff how the process works and what they can do to support them. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. Poland could pass a law that would lead to major fines for social media companies. That's if they censor users over who supports certain ideologies. The country's Deputy Justice Minister, Sebastian Coletta, told Fox News that social media companies have been targeting content that praises traditional values. He said they've been banning people or removing posts under a so-called hate speech policy. If the new law pass, any platform that restricts users for ideological reasons would face fines of $13.5 million, unless the content in question is also illegal under Polish law. The country would set up an arbitration committee to oversee disputes. Galetta said freedom of speech is not for anonymous moderators working for private companies to decide. He said that's what elected officials and the national body are for. With technology dominance, the U.S. has cards it can play in its relationship with China. And one of these cards is airplanes. NTD's Juliet Song and an aviation expert have the details. With the ongoing tension between China and the U.S., one expert is reminding Washington that it has a potential winning card, aviation technologies. That's because without American technology, Chinese airplanes can't fly. Right now, uh, other than the structure of the aircraft, that is to say, the skins, the skeleton, everything like that, uh, about 100% is imported or built in cooperation with U.S. and Western manufacturers. Abulafia says for an aircraft, the engines are all the muscles, and electronics controlling the plane is the brain. And uh, all of these are basically Western designs and, in the case of the engines, outright imports from the U.S. He says it would be hard for China to create its own substitute. Recreating a Chinese engine would take so many years and billions of dollars. Beijing has been trying to catch up for decades, but making an airplane is no simple matter. Right now, China can build the shell of the airplane, but when it comes to all the technologies that make it fly... That is all still imported or built with a great deal of assistance and U.S. or Western design. So in other words, the answer has been a lot slower than hoped for, and all of the progress that has been made has only been made with big imported programs. He has all jetliners in the world are built globally, and it would be virtually impossible for a country to build an airplane on its own. If you could do it, you'd be guaranteed of a rather bad aircraft. 
because an aircraft designer needs to be able to shop everywhere for the best technologies. So could China do it? Yes, probably in about 10 or 15 years with billions of dollars spent, and they would have a very bad aircraft as a consequence of that. And right now, the Biden administration has the card in his hands. That's because last December, the Trump administration issued an order that makes it very difficult for U.S. companies to export aviation technologies to almost 60 Chinese companies. It remains to be seen if the Biden administration will keep the order in place. Juliet Song, NTD News.